First of all, I wanted to really thank the Honorable Governor for not only coming, but providing a really, really great background on Rwanda and the financial inclusion journey that the country has made thus far, which I think we can all agree has been nothing short of impressive. And in this uh, panel and this morning, we wanted to step away a little bit from the theme of client centricity and focus on Rwanda, where we sit which is not only the land of a thousand hills, as you can see in the background, but I'm also told a million smiles. To date, the foundation has invested close to $90 million in Rwanda. As Anne mentioned in her comments, we've reached over a million people with our programming, and this is just the beginning for the foundation and our work in Rwanda. We're currently working on scoping out something we're calling the Rwanda Initiative, in very close collaboration with the government. And this will further our investment, not only in financial inclusion, but also across our other programmatic areas, focusing on education and learning, and also on youth livelihoods. So within this context, we wanted to organize a panel and to really show you why we're so excited about Rwanda. But as you heard from the governor, I think Rwanda also has a lot to teach us about financial inclusion. The rates of uptake are nothing short of impressive. We heard 89%, which I think is, is pretty great. Um, but he also mentioned, the governor also mentioned, 90% of people have insurance. Now for the Americans in the room, that's higher than the US. It's definitely higher than I would say most countries in the region. So let's dive a little bit deeper into the financial inclusion story and try to figure out exactly what it is about Rwanda that's led to such incredible growth. So we wanted to start off, and I actually wanted to have um, one of our partners in Rwanda, AFR, which the governor also mentioned, and specifically a colleague we work with uh, very closely, Ivan, come up and maybe have a short discussion about the FinScope. So Ivan, welcome. Can I maybe just ask you very briefly to introduce not only yourself, but also some of the work that AFR has been doing in Rwanda? Yeah. Thank you, Olga. I'm Ivan Morenzi, and I work with a company here in Rwanda called Access to Finance Rwanda. I'm currently the head of digital financial services at AFR. AFR is, was started in 2010 by DFID. Now we have other funders, including MasterCard Foundation, and uh, CIDA, and USAID, and KFW. So we have a number of partners working with us, and our mission is to support access to financial services, and I'm happy to be here. Great. Thank you, Ivan. So we've heard uh, about FinScope. Can you maybe tell us very briefly what FinScope is? I think maybe some in the audience might know FinScope, but some might not, and specifically what it was designed to capture. And I, the governor said there's already been three done in Rwanda. So just to give us a bit of context before we dive into the numbers. Thank you. Um, so most of us might be aware of FinScope. FinScope is quite um, a famous survey now, over 26 countries that are doing FinScope as, as a tool that is used to assess the uptake of financial services, the barriers to uptake, and the usage of financial services. And in Rwanda, as the governor has rightly put it, it's been done for the last uh, three times. Um, and it's one of the tools that has been informing the policy, not only the, fo the, the policy, but also financial service providers in terms of understanding the various segments of the population and how better they can serve. Great. What did you find? Um, so. The last FinScope survey, as the governor pointed out, indeed indicates quite a big milestone in terms of um, uptake of financial services. And um, if the slides can be on, um, as the governor pointed out, we are right now in, with total financial inclusion of 89%. Um, from 2012, 72%. And as he said, from 2008, when the first survey was done, where it was at the level of 42%, uh, we can see that um, about eight years down the road, financial inclusion has doubled. Um, and again, what we see the main change with financial inclusion going by the yellow is other form of financial services. So as the governor mentioned, one main intervention that made a big difference was the circles, deployment of circles, 416 circles. Um, 
which was an addition to other financial services. But also we see that between 2012 and 2016, mobile financial services, the uptake has been tremendous. And, and that's been the main influence. But we also see that formal inclusion is still very relevant. So what we see in the green is those people who only use informal financial services, not any other service, informal financial services. Uh, for me, this, again, as the governor has pointed out, is attributed to a number of things. It's attributed to the partnership of, of, or with financial service providers, uh, telcos, um, banks. We have had more banks. The number has doubled in the last eight years. Um, and so that's what we see here. So again, just to note, this shows someone having the service. And we can discuss further in terms of what that means. And Ivan, for, for the yellow, for the uh, other formal, how much of that has been driven by digital financial services and how much has been driven by the Umarenge SACOs? Thank you. Um, between 2012 and 2016, the main driver of, 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 of the difference has been mobile financial services by 68%. So the change from 19 to 42% has been mainly driven by uh, mobile financial, someone being able to have a, dig a mobile account where they can send money or pay bills. Great. And do we know who the excluded are and what um, the biggest barriers are also to, to including them yeah. in the financial sector? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting that, yes, we still have a number of people who only keep money to themselves. So when we say excluded, it's someone who does not use any other external means to manage their money. That means they will keep it either in, under their mattress. One of the main issues definitely is, um, is poverty, but also access. As much as circles have gone out and we have 416, there are some segments of the population that still have a distance to reach those financial service, uh, services. But also we see a number of other things, uh, mobile, is an issue maybe of just understanding how the service can be used. So th th there's some work to be done around that as well. Well, there's no doubt that there's been some impressive growth in uptake. What about usage? Um, so I just want us to draw to this graph now, because as the governor said, with, that, with the progress made with you know, access, financial inclusion, it's worth to begin looking deep and ask ourselves, what does this translate to? Because as was rightly said yesterday, for financial inclusion to improve people's lives, it has got to do with usage. It has got to do if I use the service that I have, and also the, 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 the variety of services that I can access. So what I have here is that um, we are able to see usage in terms of the time someone has used the account, either one month, the past one month. So if I focus on 2016, we see that those who are financially included, only 30% had used the service in the last one month, and 23% in the last six months. And we see quite some inactivity. So someone has the service, they might have an account of an MFI or SACO, and we have counted them as financially included, but they are not using the service, and that, and that should be a concern, and some of the issues were mentioned yesterday. Um, but I want to draw us to this other um, bar graph down here, which is something that has been developed in partnership with Finmark Trust, um, to look at the quality of usage. And what we have is that 50% of the financial included, so the 89% that, that was mentioned, are thinly served, and, and only 44% are moderately served, and 6% adequately served. And I will explain what thinly served is. So thinly served is someone who might have, who might be only informally served, so we saw the, the figure 21% who are only informally served, or they might have the formal account of a, of a circle or an MFI or a bank, or a mobile account, but it's quite inactive, okay? They have the account, but it's quite inactive. Um, so if we talk of financial inclusion improving their lives, then these people, honestly, um, financial inclusion has not yet meant much for them. The model it has served, uh, people might have at least two services, so they might be uh, having a mobile account, they might be having a bank account, but also it's uh, rarely used. Maybe it's been used in the last three months. Um, 
all, all the mites also have insurance. Uh, insurance here, we exclude Mutuel, uh, the, the, the governor mentioned. We're, we're lo more looking at other services. So for me, this paints a picture of, of work to be done, but I should add that what's interesting with this 50% is that 61% have a mobile phone, so it could be a more an issue of sensitization and education. And what's interesting also is that two thirds of them have at least secondary level of education or higher. So there's an opportunity as, as much as the quality is not good yet. Great, so we've made good progress in uptake. There's still some, some room to grow or sure. a lot of room to grow in terms of usage. If I were to ask you the three or four things that really need to happen for financial inclusion to grow in Rwanda, and you do have ambitious targets of 100% financial inclusion, so that's, that's great. What would you say would be those four things, that, three or four things that really would push the financial inclusion agenda? Thank you. Um, I've just listed the, the, you know, about four things here. Um, one thing we believe that you know, will create, especially more access to formal financial services, is uh, digitization of payments. Um, and here we are looking into what probably we have mentioned already, like health, um, uh, health insurance payments, or government subsidies to the poor, or education. If we digitize those payments, what we will be doing is that we'll be creating, we'll be giving people an opportunity to have a digital account. Now, it doesn't only stop uh, to having the, the ability to be paid or to pay for a service using a mobile. What we see is that it would create an experience, a user experience. And that experience would create opportunities in terms of other services being raided on top of that. So imagine someone, a parent, where in the village and he has to pay school fees and he has to go to the school or find the nearest circle where he can deposit the school fees. Now, if that was digitized and they, have to, and they can do it from their mobile, okay, there's that experience of doing, of, of paying the service, but actually it creates an opportunity that a bank or an insurance company sees more people with a digital wallet and they can build on other products and services. And, um, that, that's to go with number three. So we could then see how we, we motivate, support the likes of us as FR. We are, doing, we are doing a number of partnerships with various financial services providers. And the issue has been, where are the numbers? Where are the numbers that we can ride on to deploy more services? So yeah, products, as the governor pointed out, but also education um, is very key as much as we can launch out a number of financial services, and it's happening, but that has to be complemented with education. That has to be complemented with sensitization. And then people can understand those services. So that's also key. And lastly, fintech companies. And, and I'm happy, Olga, that we have a representative here. Uh, I strongly believe that the future of financial inclusion will be driven by fintech companies. We just need to give them the environment, we just need to give them the, the support. Um, so how we work with them, how we integrate them in the financial ecosystem, how we support them, uh, they, are, they have brilliant ideas in terms of um, bringing out products and in terms of bringing out services. So I think to me, as AFR, that's our focus. Wonderful. Thank you. Ivan, thank you. I think we're going to dig deeper into some of your insights into the panel, but I appreciate your... Welcome. Getting us. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Now we're going to turn over to not only our distinguished, but very well-dressed panel. <laughs> and I'm glad I'm, I'm a woman to, to just even the gender balance out. But we specifically invited a very diverse panel because we thought, you know, if we're going to tell the financial inclusion story for Rwanda, we need to hear that story from a variety of perspectives. So we've invited representatives from the private sector, from fintechs, from the government, um, and also from uh, the donor community to really help us understand this story. So I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves and also to, to tell the audience which voice you'll represent on the panel. So. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Olga. My name is Bilal Zia. I work at the World Bank in the research department in Washington, D.C. Um, and because I'm a researcher, I'm wearing a suit, uh, which is very rare. So that, that shows that I'm very excited to be here. Um, 
Thank you. And I represent the voice of the donor. Uh, thank you, Olga. Um, my name is Eric Rigamba. I'm the Director General in charge of Financial Sector Development at the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning. Uh, of course, I represent the policymakers and um, somehow the regulator. So we do have a regulator in the room for, for the gentleman who commented that we don't. Sorry. Thank you. Um, my name is Jean-Claude Gaga. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of R-Switch. R-Switch being the national e-payments uh, processor in Rwanda. And our mandate is simple, to just expand the financial ecosystem for Rwandans. I'll be speaking as a voice of the private sector. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Patrick Tsenga Buchana. I'm the chief executive of AC Group, a company that's into smart transport solutions. And uh, we majorly focus on digitizing uh, public transport payments. And I'll be speaking as a voice of the innovation and fintech community. Thank you and welcome. So Bilal, the first question is for you. You work across a number of different countries uh, at the World Bank. And I know you, you understand different um, financial inclusion journeys and, and you've seen the sector, different sectors. What is it about Rwanda that makes Rwanda unique compared to some of the other countries that you've seen and, and worked in? Um, sure. So Rwanda is, uh, has made significant progress in both financial inclusion and financial stability. And both aspects, uh, the World Bank has, has engagement with Rwanda on. And in order to answer your question, since I'm a data nerd, uh, I'm going to bring in some more data, which is the Global Findex, or the finan Financial Inclusion Index, which the World Bank puts out uh, in collaboration with the Gallup World Poll. So there are two years of data, 2011 and 2014. Um, and it complements the work that FinScope has done and the governor shared and um, was shared earlier. Um, it, uh, what the additional value of the FINDEX is that it allows a comparison, not only across time between 2011 and 2014, but also comparison within the region, within uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and also global averages. Um, so account penetration has gone up significantly in Rwanda, which, is, which has been shown by and, and spoken about by the governor. But what's really interesting is that the account penetration in Rwanda is higher than the average in Sub-Saharan Africa, and it's above average for the global uh, Rwanda GDP per capita, so which, is, which is very good news. The other good news is that the urban-rural divide is very small in Rwanda compared to the Sub-Saharan African average. And this is primarily, I think, because of the SACO initiative. So the SACOs have penetrated in many rural areas, brought financial inclusion, financial services to the rural areas, and that's, uh, that's a very key progress. Um, formal financial services usage and penetration is also higher in Rwanda than the sub-Saharan African average. Um, and finally, um, sending and re receiving remittances digitally is much higher in Rwanda than the sub-Saharan African uh, average. So these are some of the key um, aspects uh, in financial inclusion that separate Rwanda from the rest of the countries in the region. What do you think has been really the key driver of, of kind of the growth, which is clear not only in the FinSco, but obviously in the FinDEX as well? Yeah, so the key driver is that this is a very reform-oriented client. Um, it, they know what they want, and it's, it's a very demand-driven approach. So if the World Bank uh, goes to Eric's office, and, and it's not us telling us what we can do, but Eric is telling us what he wants. And, and, and they know what they want. So it's, it's a very reform-oriented client. Um, they're committed to creating an innovative financial inclusion sector, uh, financial inclusion strategy, which they have a very, very uh, sort of innovative strategy already in place. Financial inclusion is a key part of that strategy. And lastly, this is again sort of going back to my heart as a researcher, is that they're committed to evaluation. So I actually arrived earlier, a week early, for this uh, to do some to go into the field, uh, because I'm part of this uh, impact evaluation of financial education through SACOs that the World Bank is supporting. And I was in the field, and this work is being supported by many different sectors within Rwanda. And this commitment to evaluation is very important. Great, thank you, Eric. We've heard that Rwanda is one of the only places where the government is far ahead of the private sector, and in fact, pushes the private sector to, to really innovate and to be groundbreaking. 
And I'm telling you, Rwanda is one of the only countries where I've worked, and I've worked across a number of countries in the region, where you can go and sit in the office and the government will tell you exactly what they want. And they're very clear on that. So do you agree that the government is ahead of the private sector? And why? Why is this the case? Where does this, where does this come from? Uh, uh, thank you, Olga. I, I think uh, uh, probably to comment on this requires to first picture the right context uh, uh, in, in which Rwanda um, probably operates. I think our story uh, goes back to the 94, 1994, when we had the dark days of our, our country. And from that situation, the leadership of this country um, made a deliberate decision to rebuild and reconstruct the country. It was almost considered a failed state. So um, there was a desire to, to, to rebuild the country and um, that required that you would define exactly what the country should be looking like moving forward and be able to do a kind of catch up when uh, other countries were progressing, probably for us who are sleeping. And so it required in a different way of doing things, doing things different. So um, what happened was really to define uh, the vision of the country and what should be achieved. So the targets the governor touched on were deliberate and they were defined. And um, so uh, the, the decision was to say, where do we want to be? How do we get there? So a framework was defined to ensure that um, there's a role for everyone to play, the private sector, the government, and the moment partners and friends of Rwanda. Now what happened uh, during the course of implementation was that in some instances, the private sector was slow to, to respond for the good reason that maybe some areas were not attractive enough. Um, and so quite often the government would step in to take a lead, including this hotel. Uh, the government had not, probably do not have interest in building hotels, but we needed a hotel and there was no hotel in this country. So the government had to come in. When it was up and running, the private sector came and picked interest. No wonder, now it's a different story. The same in all sectors. Uh, in, in, uh, and so a lot has been to do with, we need to, we to, we need, we need to be somewhere. Probably just to touch on, uh, to, to, to link it to what uh, Bill said. Again, what has worked again a lot is to bring everyone on the table. So for the financial sector, if I may say, uh, I'm comment on that, we have, a financial sector working group, where we get the private sector, the regulator, the policy makers, the donors, and, us, and people from the, 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 the civil society to sit on the table and define uh, what the financial sector should be looking at, looking like. So the, the financial sector depending program that was majorly uh, developed through a very wide consultative process helped a lot to figure out what reforms should be implemented. And that, for me, uh, I think has been a very important aspect of getting everyone on, on, on the table and define the right path that the country should be taking. Actually, just on that point of collaboration, one thing I also notice that happens here in Rwanda is, is you very frequently change leadership at the top, right? So for example, I know the Minister of Finance has been in the seat of the governor, and I think vice versa as well. So is that one way really to foster I guess a, a good collaboration across different ministries and go, you know government entities and and uh, is this true by the way? Uh, Does it happen a lot? I think the the, the key issue that I probably I find very uh, I travel quite a lot uh, I find very exciting for me and different for Rwanda is uh, from the the ministers and the permanent secretaries and the DGs and everyone governors and mayors. They sign performance contracts with the, their superiors. And they are, there are a number of KPIs embedded there. They are measured and they are rewarded those who perform. But those who do not, of course, they also get a share of their uh, reward. So that, I think, has created a very uh, inefficient, efficient framework under which the government operates more probably like a private sector. So there you go. So for, for everyone in the room going back to your respective countries, make sure that the governments all have KPIs to really ensure that there's performance. Jean-Claude, 
over to you. I wanted, you know, Ivan pointed out that there is still a pretty serious usage uh, problem, and and um, I wanted to know how you think the industry can really collaborate to to increase these these numbers on on usage. Um, and maybe Eric, I'll ask you later if there's any if there if you think there'll be any targets at the government level around around usage. Thank you. Olga, um, maybe just before I get in, I just want to reiterate uh, the fact that whether government is really ahead of private or not, I'd rather say uh, this is nothing to negate the progress that government is making. I'd rather say that uh, we tend to see a very thin line uh, between the public sector and the private sector in Rwanda. Now, I'll give an example of what we're trying to achieve at our switch, for instance, uh, the central bank is a regular that came in and set clear guidelines for interoperability. And this is what the policy said, you need to do A, B, C, D. And what we did, of course, as uh, the player in the middle, uh, at the center of, of the financial ecosystem, uh, we just had to enable uh, connectivity to all the other participants, and we were following the rules that have been placed there, and that's what the story of interoperability has been. That's how we achieved over 90% interoperability on card-based transactions. And today we can say we are at least above 75% on mobile side, uh, because through a platform we've been able to connect two MNOs out of three. Uh, all the banks in the country at least are mandated to acquire uh, all the schemes that are issued in the country. But again, to deep uh, dive into your question on usage, uh, I think oftentimes, and I believe this is something that uh, Kwame, one of the speakers earlier mentioned yesterday, uh, to do with whether we actually evolve around the customer or whether customers will evolve around our initiatives. I think, first of all, I trace it in the definition of who a customer is. Uh, oftentimes, we sit in the boardrooms, the product development teams, and we isolate the customer as an individual outside the room. Whereas, actually, I believe we need to start from within. Probably the customer is the business development manager themselves or even the chief executive. Once we have that right, I think that is when the value comes ahead of price. So for me, defining the customer is key and putting value ahead of price. Number two, uh, I believe it's to do a lot of what they mentioned, awareness and education. It is one thing, yes, I know we all want to have the right KYCs, uh, but oftentimes we tend to see this becoming an entry barrier uh, when you set very strong KYCs as well as the embedded service fees. So we need to really have a right mix of KYC as well as uh, service fees. And last but not least, of course, is uh, access uh, and education for the customer. If however beautiful your product is, if I cannot access it, uh, I will definitely not have it. Uh, for the mobile side, I believe that is where we've seen a lot of progress, and that explains the growth of uh, the impact on the Finscope surveys through mobile, is that we have seen an exponential growth into touch points of uh, merchants or agents uh, for, for the telcos, where we are able to do a uh, cash-in, cash-out, or even merchant payment uh, of services. So for me, uh, those are the key areas I would really say that will drive usage. Okay, and, and just as a private sector, um, I'm assuming you, you inter interact a lot with the government and you're very, they're very clear on, on what it is that they want. Are the targets sometimes set too high? Are they, are they realistic, uh, you know, regarding what you can do and, and, and or, or, or what do you think? Are, are you intimidated by, by these targets as, as a player? Or? I do not think I've ever been intimidated and just like I say, <laughs> By saying that it's a very thin line, I think this is the only stage where we've been probably further apart uh, <laughs> by the government and private sector. And yes, it is one good thing for them to set the, the bar quite high because that translates into transactions. For me, it translates into revenues uh, if the bar is set quite high. So uh, clearly, it's an ambitious government uh, that sets the pace for us to be able to dig into and make money out of such ambitions. Eric, you have to. Yeah, Olga, I think for me, the issue is not uh, probably the high targets. The issue is how can we use the financial services to transform the lives of our people? So if you say the target is high, that means some people matter that they do not. So I think that's where the challenge is. So for us, we've made it clear everyone matters. Everyone requires these services because we think 
everyone needs these services to be able to, to have a better life. So I think what we have done with the access to finance Rwanda and other, um, uh, we have also another financial inclusion vehicle under the, the UN family, is to use the Finiscope data. We have been able to get the Finiscope data and try to do a bit more uh, data mining to look at, based on this data that we have, what kind of information that is specific for financial inclusion for women, for example. So we've been able to dig deep and extract a lot of information that is informing our financial inclusion strategy that the governor touched on. We have also looked at the geographical kind of spread of financial inclusion. We are saying, so most of our population are living in rural areas. And the, uh, again, access to finance has, uh, Rwanda has decided to kind of extract information that would be useful to design products and services that are targeting the poor, the women, the youth, the rural people. Uh, we have also taken it further to see what are the opportunities within that data that we have that we can be able to use to develop products that are probably leveraging on technology. So for me, the issue of target is not a, uh, probably the challenge here because we have no choice. We need to serve these people. They need these services. Just, just to complement what uh, Eric said here. So um, when we do evaluations or impact evaluations, the first step is a needs assessment. That's understanding what the needs are. And what you're saying is looking at the FinScope data, understanding what the, where the problem areas are, which demographics are left behind, where the success is, what is the reason for the success, what are the constraints. That's exactly what you do when you go and design an impact evaluation. You do a needs assessment. So I'm very encouraged by your uh, advancements in that area. And Eric, just one more thing on these targets. Where do they come from, and who do they apply to? OK. Uh, the, um, very exciting, I think, to look at the way it is mapped out and aligned. So we have the government uh, uh, strategic document, which spells out these targets. So in the, the government of Rwanda, um, economic development and the poverty reduction strategy for the five years, there is a target for the financial inclusion which what the governor touched on by 2020, we think should be around, um, um, uh, it keeps on, I think the government is so ambitious. So initially it is 90%. I've had in the corridors, I think about 100%. So, uh, so they come from the, the national agenda. But what we do is to, as I said, through the working, financial sector working group, to bring everyone on the table and the, put in place actions that addresses all the barriers in the different areas in the whole ecosystem to make sure that we get the, uh, we achieve the targets. Do we have a choice not to or to achieve it? No, we must achieve okay. them. So but they come from the top. They come right? from the top. And, and go work. to the bottom. Yes. So no matter where you are, you have targets. If you don't meet them, I'll happens? give an example probably that's very practical. The, the mayors, when they, they were signing their performance contracts for 14-15, uh, and 1516, there was a target for financial inclusion. So the people live with the mayors, so the mayors are supposed to be strong enough to drive financial inclusion. And people would think maybe that's more political or local government issues. No, the people that you are leading requires the services. And so it's everyone who's storage and everyone who's uh, probably tasked to drive it. Great, thank you. Patrick, our FinTech voice. Um, you're a fintech who's been working, and you told me very clearly you are no longer a startup, um, working in this space for a few years, really to, to also drive the financial inclusion agenda. How well are you positioned uh, in this country and in this space to really be able to contribute effectively? Yeah, um, so when you work in a bank today or any financial institution and you, talk, you ask for a loan, the first question they ask you is, um, what's your credit worth? And to many financial institu institutions, credit worth is equal to how much collateral you have. That's in terms of land, building. Um, but there's a very thin line between an individual, cooperative, or inst an institution that is um, credit worthy and one that's not. And that's the ability to actually um, collect and show your data for the last one year, the last two years. And you find that many of these institutions um, companies, individuals, actually have been performing well, but
But because they have no mechanism of collecting their data, they're not able to, to access finance. And that's where the fintechs come in. Um, look at what AC Group is doing uh, with uh, public transport. I've, you know, two years ago, public transport, all the data was collected on paper. Uh, with AC Group, um, with our card-based solution, we're able to collect and digitize all their payments and show it um, over a period of time and basically give them information and data that they previously didn't have and also help them make decisions. But this information has not only help them in their decision making, but also help them approach financial institutions and say, we're a cooperative, um, 5, 10, 15, 100 of our members now want to get new buses, and this is their track record. And they've been able to access finance. Now, this cuts across um, different sectors, teeth uh, farmers, uh, the dairy industry, and, 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 and many of these other uh, sectors. And, you know, fintech companies, I think, as, as Ivan said, it is their time, and they are the drive for financial inclusion. Um, definitely, there's a lot of challenges with you know, starting a fintech company, especially around regulation. At the moment, uh, many of the fintech companies um, are regulated like microfinances. And I think that's a discussion we've been trying to have with government. Uh, you almost need 300 million to start a fintech company. And you can imagine, if it's a startup, that's already, you know, you're already discouraging. Um, data access to data is still a problem. Uh, Eric said government comes in to some of the you know, projects or financial inc inclusion programs because private sector does not find it fit or does not find it lucrative. And that's because you know, the information is not uh, easily shared. There's a lot of information, um, but it's split out into different institutions and you know, getting access to it is still a, it's still a big challenge. And of course, uh, when you look at you know, the different um, products around fintech, uh, when you want to integrate with payment you know, with the banks or with the telecoms, they still want to take the largest share. And you know, it doesn't make the business uh, lucrative anymore. So there's a lot of challenges. Um, but there's also a lot of opportunities. And I think that fintechs are going to be the drive for financial inclusion especially looking at Rwanda, because almost, you know, the one thing that Rwandans have is mobile phones, uh, 80, almost 80% 80 coverage. And I think that's, that's the best foundation for any fintech, any fintech company to start. And how well are you supported by the government to succeed in this space? Well, um, we're supported by the government in two ways. Um, speaking on behalf of myself, the first is that definitely they have laid a lot of the foundation that is needed. Um, and, and I think Eric will speak more about that. But the second is that when you start something, then you have to actually complete it. And then they give you targets that, as you said, are very ambitious, and you actually have to achieve them because the government is doing their part. And uh, so majorly those two, uh, the different ways in which government is supporting. But most importantly, the foundation is already laid, so we just have to run on it. And Eric, is there a role for fintechs to play in this financial inclusion movement? Uh, yes, um, quite a lot, especially when you look at the kind of people we are talking about here, probably majority at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, if you think of serving them through the traditional um, branches, brick and mortar branches, I think it's going to be very hard. Uh, so I think there's a lot of space uh, for fintech, and we, we, we think it's, uh, um, something that can unlock most of the challenges that we are having. Uh, just to, to probably to touch on that, again, when you look at this, the, the, the circles, the circles they're talking about here, basically we are serving and create cooperatives. Uh, we have launched a program, uh, a project to automate them so that they, they have the data that we are talking about and be able to be linked to um, uh, these fintech solutions that are coming up. So we totally believe that he, and they support them. We, we think um, uh, this, the, the number of discussions around how do we create, probably facilitate, and create a bit of competition so that they can come up with different innovative solutions that would be able to serve our people better. Uh, they, they are very organized. Uh, and that helps us to, I think, the government to work with them. They, uh, under the private sector federation, they have a chamber where they've come together, they organize themselves, 
to be able to look at the opportunities the market offers and be able to tap into them. So we, we totally agree that he, he see the, the next, I think, um, um, uh, enabler that we should be working with. Now, uh, Patrick touched on, I think, on the, the challenges. Yes, we all agree it's a new uh, a player in the market. Uh, as we, we get so much excited about financial inclusion, we need to, to think about stability of the financial sector. So uh, there's always a, a, a need to strike a balance between the two. Um, uh, but I think what is very important is that we are on the table. We are, we are discussing on, on how can we do it better and uh, probably safe. Um, I think the issue of the requirement he touched on on the 300 million requirement uh, treated as a microfinance institution, uh, it has its own uh, rationale because some of the fintech companies that are coming up, they are able to save and lend. So you are lending and taking deposits. So if you are doing that, then um, there's a bit of risk that you are holding people's deposits somewhere in the cloud. So I think the issue is very good, but we need to place it. Okay. I just wanted to add uh, probably my voice to the two opinions here. I think we had earlier touched on, on access, and this is something that uh, I mentioned earlier. If you're looking at a sustainable way uh, for product development or usage, uh, this is one way to look at it. Uh, at our switch, for instance, uh, thanks to the enabling environment, the clear policy guidelines, uh, we've been able to come up uh, with a backbone onto which uh, the initiative you just mentioned about, the circles that are able to plug into. And this is why, again, we keep pushing uh, government to offer clarity, clarity, and clarity so that we avoid duplication. If we have such a, bu a big initiative, uh, they are bringing almost 400 plus institutions onto one backbone. And then let's have this backbone connect to another existing backbone as opposed to uh, creating other silos. And I think this is something that uh, Central Bank was quite clear from the beginning, that let's avoid duplication, let's avoid bilateral models. Let's have a hub kind of unspoke model that our switch has been able to provide. And then eventually we get to see these uh, previously marginalized participants in the ecosystem coming onto the table as participants, but not as the menu for, for, for others to come and split what share do I take. So it's very key that uh, we continue to keep the focus on ensuring that we, have, we look at the bigger picture of, of things. So I know Rwanda um, has been working in, in our switch in, included and been a, a big uh, driver of this on really connecting and I think now what you're talking about is connecting the Umarenge Sakos essentially to the backbone, to, to our switch, so, so right. the digitization of Sakos. So it seems like there's already a lot going on. It seems like there's quite a few players. Is there a role for fintech? It, is there enough space in this market for fintech? And if there is, where, where do they fit in? What could they, how are they competing with the private sector? Are they going to complement some of the things that, that you do? Are you afraid of Patrick, or is Patrick going to help you somehow? Patrick is serving me a lot on my ERC budget for development. So I'm definitely seeing him as a partner, because he's the kind of the feeder road that brings him onto my highway. Okay. So I definitely appreciate what he's doing. What, what uh, I see most of my advice is uh, let them be more innovative, and let them be mindful of security. Before you connect to our ecosystem, we are the only PCI DSS compliant ecos uh, platform in this country. Uh, for those in the payment industry, I believe understand what standard this is. It's world-class standard. So most times when they want to connect, certain times you say these are the standards and this is our spec. Uh, sometimes it becomes of a it's, it, they see it as a challenge uh, rather than see it as this is a fact. You're going to channel people's funds people's transactions to us, and then we'll deliver them to the other institutions. So it is important that they remain mindful of security and mindful of innovation rather than competing. If he's already doing transport, let somebody else look at products around something else that will facilitate this, but rather not compete. Since he has one bus company, let me push for the next bus company, and you have three fintechs within the same uh, sector. 
Go ahead. I add one thing to that. So just adding to the challenge and perhaps highlighting a, a, an area where uh, innovation, digitization, and education, all the points that Ivan pointed out, can come together is the area of um, digital, di digitizing agricultural payments. So the FINDEX highlights that as one area where Rwanda is actually weak. So digitizing remittances, sending and receiving, Rwanda is very strong. But for agricultural payments, cash is still king. So that's an area where both of you can come together and other players to, to bring in the, the farmers and digitize the agricultural system. So that's where maybe innovative products, maybe educating the farmers on the advantages of digitizing payments would all come together and have a happy marriage. And, and yep. uh, Just to touch on, I think, uh, the digital space, I think uh, when you look at um, what uh, probably someone touched on, I think the governor, on the mission and probably it's a decision already to get all the government services brought on one platform, run online. So when I think about that, I always say, so if the government had decided to offer all the services online, that means that the, 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 the players in the payment space should be looking at that, at that as an opportunity. And now, sorry, sorry, Eric, can you just explain very briefly to the audience what Rwanda Online is? Basically, what uh, we have done is to get all the services that are offered by the government to Rwanda, all of them, automate the process so that you can log, just log in and get your passport, your birth certificate, your land, uh, land title, just name it, online. So you, just, you don't have to move different offices to get that, including things to do with registering your business, and getting a license and so on and so forth. So what we are just saying, all the services that the government will be offering to the citizens should be obtained online. So, but that's the process of applying and accessing it. So there's an, an, an aspect of payment. And that's for me where I saw an opportunity for the, uh, the dictator, uh, for the guys who are in the payment system. But also now, if the government has taken that step, how about are the processes in the private sector? So uh, I think for me that's where I see the challenge, that he, when people keep on saying the government's leading, probably it's not leading, they're just saying we need to be, move, move a bit faster. So uh, and I think that's for me uh, where uh, uh, the opportunity lies. So you're not leading, you're accelerating. No, we, we, we want everyone to be on board so that when we are doing this. Uh, so let me look at, say it this way, the challenge that is ahead of us. So if I'm going to apply for a, a passport through uh, in my office, and when I want a bank check or my credit card, and it come and line up at your bank, uh-uh, there's something missing. So that's, I think, the kind of message we are sending out there. OK. So this is, by the way, not approved yet by the foundation. And it's hypothetical. But if I were to give you $10 million, <laughs> and and if I were to ask you to invest that money, and I'm asking uh, if, you could, if we can put up those four opportunities that Ivan noted earlier, back up on the screen. They'll come. Anyways, if I were to ask you, there we go, to, to invest in one of those four opportunities, very briefly, because I want to leave a little bit of time for questions, where would you put your money to really drive financial inclusion? And Patrick, why don't we start with you, because I know where, the, where, where this might be going. On your end, where, where would you invest? <laughs> well, um, to start with, I, I know a very interesting company called AC Group. So I definitely, <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely invest um, in this company, and this is why. So, you know, uh, at the moment they have, um, you know, RFID cards uh, for public transport, and at the moment there's almost 300,000 people using these cards. So, and the number grows with, by almost seven to 10,000 every single day. So we're looking at more than a million by the you know, end of the year. So all these people are having cards and they're just using them for public transport. So why not add other use cases? Why not let these people you know, use this card you know, for public transport, for something else, for this, for that? And we're already talking to different other players in the market um, to see how to actually have this card work on their different platforms. And definitely, uh, as Gaga said, there's, there's a lot of room for collaboration. If a certain institution, say R-Switch, has already set up you know, 
a network of agents doing ABC, why not ride on that already existing network? But for sure, that's where I would put the 10 million. Patrick would invest in himself. That's great. <laughs> what, about, what about everyone else? Fortunately, I wouldn't invite myself since he's already focused on the fintech. I would take number three, which is mostly on product innovation. Uh, my assumption and my hope being that the remaining two will take uh, the one and two. Reason being, <laughs> the slide before this we noticed, we are talking 89% financial inclusion in Rwanda. But when it got deeper, we realized that we are all competing for the 6% that are adequately served. So what is happening to the rest? That is where the innovation comes in. Why do we keep competing for 6% when there is all this wide pie that uh, we keep talking about at our switch? And of course, that is why I say, when there's that innovation, I very much uh, want to believe and rest assured that uh, that will end up uh, on my doorstep. You would also invest in yourself in some way. <laughs> so, um, from my side, unfortunately, because I work at the World Bank, it will be a violation of the employee agreement to invest in myself. There we go. <laughs> However, I can invest in, in, in the type of work that I do indirectly. So, uh, the points that Ivan put out, I would actually agree with all of them. So, digitize, innovate, educate, but then I will add one of my own, which is evaluate. I think evaluation is key. There's so much innovation happening. There's so many new products out there. But as the governor pointed out, and as Ivan pointed out, usage is lagging behind access. So we have access, but people aren't using these products on a regular basis. So there's some constraint there. How do we relieve this constraint? Financial education is one area. Maybe using behavioral insights is another area. There could be other more innovative products. How do we know which one works best, right? So we need to run Somebody raised a point about randomista, so I'm a randomista. Um, we need to do more rigorous science here. So we look at other fields, we look at medicine, we look at technology, and they do science, and they do innovation, and they test, and then they retest, and improve their products. That will, that's what we need to do in public policy as well. We need to evaluate the products, the innovations that we have, see which ones work best, adopt those, and the ones that don't work, highlight what the constraints are, and then improve those constraints, and if we can improve them, then move on to something else. So that's where evaluation would be very key, and it will work, work hand in hand with innovation and um, uh, education. So when everyone's investing in themselves, you, you just want to invest in figuring out what works. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Eric. Uh, Olga, I think, it's, for me, it's hard because one million. Uh, it's, ten million. Oh, you've been president. Ten million. Okay, ten million. I think, <laughs> first of all, very, very, very important is to get, uh, I think, the data. Because the biggest challenge is we need to, 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 to I think, to, 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 to innovate and move away from really sitting in our comfortable offices and designing products for the people. So I think we, I would put a, maybe a million to, to get the data that is very, very relevant. But I think the most uh, uh, useful part of it is to, under, to, to develop the products that uh, suit the needs of people. I'll speak very fast on that, uh, touching on the history. Um, when, when the Murengi Sako was rolled out in every administrative sector, uh, today we have about 2.5 million people as members, as clients. That's powerful. These are people that do not have anything apart from keeping the money on themselves. When, when the, the savings groups, the informal, what they call the informal savings groups, when Access to Finance Rwanda rolled out uh, several groups, we see um, uh, about 500,000 people being able to save, being able to borrow through those uh, uh, groups. Uh, when you look at mobile money in this country, and probably in East Africa, uh, the way it has changed the financial sector uh, landscape, you just see that people just need the appropriate service, the appropriate product. So I think for me, a big chunk of that, so one million is on data uh, and research and evaluation. I'll get about another probably 70% on innovation, and the last component is really uh, delivery channels. If you are going to think about setting out branches to serve the people that we are talking about here at the pyramid, at the bottom, at the, at the bottom of the pyramid, who are poor, small saving, small loans, through the branches which are expensive, it won't work out. 
So I think we need to tie up all these, to have an, a distribution channels that are convenient, that are affordable to these people we're talking about. So, and the why I, I do not pay attention to education is because for Rwanda, for us, we have moved. We, we have incorporated financial education in the school curriculum. So from primary, from high school, from the university, school curriculum has been embedded into the program. Uh, we have uh, a program for financial education and literacy through the World Bank support um, to reach out to the rural people to teach them about these basics. So on that, I think, space, there's a lot to do, but I think we have set out the, the foundation. So much of it will be, for me, innovation and a bit of um, proper delivery channels to reach out to these people. Okay, thank you. So let me turn over to, to you and see if there's any questions around what the panel has said. And let me just ask for you to, to be specific on who you want to address the question to. Unless we've stunned you into silence, which is also OK. But I do see one already. I see two. Uh, so maybe can we start with the back and then move to the, to the front with the mics? Or you can just stand up and try to scream. Uh, or, oh, sorry, we have one. OK. Uh, um, yeah, my name's Anton Samanowitz from Social Performance Solutions. I'm, I'm really interested in the um, advance that's been made in financial inclusion. But I want to come back to sort of what is the goal around financial inclusion. So we've heard about access, we've heard about quality. Um, so I'm just going to put my glasses so I can read this, but I just, I just want to ask a question in relation to, um, I suppose, the clients, the customers. Um, so um, there's, there's a really nice definition, vision for financial inclusion from FI 2020, which talks about access to a quality range of services so that people can invest in their futures, build assets, cope with life shocks. And I want to ask about your vision for financial inclusion and the extent to which this access, the quality of services, the innovation of products are really built around that vision for the use of the services in terms of people managing their risks, managing their, their anticipated and unexpected needs. Um, investing, fulfilling their life streams. And that, that's what I'd like to ask the whole panel, I think. Uh, probably if I can take a shot on that. Uh, thank you so much. I think very relevant question. I think um, when you look at the way we are looking at financial inclusion in Rwanda is really to look at um, uh, how do we use it as an enabler to, to, to transform the lives of our people. Um, and from that understanding, we think everyone should be given an opportunity to contribute to the growth and development of the country. So from that, we have been able to put in place a number of uh, um, initiatives and projects that we think we'll be able to do that. So if I can touch on them very fast. One, we looked at farmers. And so we think, how do you get farmers into the system? So when the government worked with the private sector to attract, for example, the commodities exchange in this country, was more to create um, a system where farmers would be able to, uh, to make better use of their um, output. So for those who are not familiar with the commodities exchange, it's basically to, where you help to, them to discover the prices, but also be able to use them through the cultural management system and the warehouses systems to use them as collateral when they want to access funding. And that is working so far today when I see farmers from different countries being able to keep their produce into well-organized, well-managed warehouse receipt systems, which gives us data to know how much is being produced, how much is being traded, at what price. We think that is helping a lot on the farmers. We have also tried to do automation of the circles that is intended to ensure that more products can be uh, distributed and can be accessed by the, the people. So uh, governor mentioned the universal insurance, health insurance. We think that to be delivered to people, you need a better delivery channel that is convenient. 
we have just approved a pension scheme for people working for informal sector. So we think today we uh, we talk about this credit saving account credit and, and loans, but what about when the people uh, they are retiring? So we have developed that as an, a solution that we should add on the list of the financial services that would really help the people live uh, a, a, a better life. So again, so what I'm trying to talk about here, the, we are just trying to increase the range of products and the services, financial service services, that would really make the life of a person better. So from insurance, from pension, from saving, from credit, and, and we think that is really for us this, the kind of financial inclusion that would transform the life of a person. So you're already actively working on usage. Okay. If anybody else wants to respond briefly, you can. But otherwise, maybe we can take one more question from... Oh, there's a lot of questions now. Okay. I know, I think in the front here, you, your hand has been up for, for a while. So could we get a mic there or... No more questions, okay. Questions, for, oh, I see, okay, wow, no more questions. Okay. So what, I wanted to, we'll do it at coffee time, so my apologies. But just to thank very much the, the panel, the governor, um, and also Ivan for, for really kicking us off. And I think not just the foundation, but I'm assuming the entire world will continue to watch as Rwanda's financial inclusion story really evolves. Um, you know, I did say we, we have stepped away from customer centricity theme a little bit, um, but really I think Rwanda is a great example to show you that you can be client centric just not at the institutional level, but across not only a sector, but an entire country and almost, I'm sure almost everyone working in the financial sector in Rwanda knows FinScope and it's literally all the figures are in the back of their minds and they know their targets. Um, so I would say this is exactly the type of focus that we need to drive really financial inclusion. And I'm hoping that you can take some of the lessons back, um, back to your respective countries and, and also work to contribute to financial inclusion. So thank you very much for, for the panel. Thank you to the panelists.